the um, executive director of the North American Association for Environmental Education, which we call NAAEE because it's just too much of a mouthful. And we're going to talk about NAAEE and the GEEP, the Global Environmental Education Partnership. And I first want to thank Derek and the whole Ion Earth Network and everybody that helped put this together. There were a lot of organizations that helped make this possible, and we are thrilled to be here. So welcome to our session, which is about education. And uh, it is great to be in Dubai. We're really happy to be here. And we're really excited to have a chance to talk about environmental education as a way, even though we're talking about lemurs and Madagascar, but we're really happy to be here in Dubai. And to all of the folks that are online, we look forward to hearing your questions and uh, appreciate that you're listening from afar. And I want to introduce the other people that are part of this panel. Melissa Hopkins Taggart works for me at NAAE, works with me, not for me, with me at NAAE. She's the director of our international programs. And Gayatri, I'll, I think everyone in the world knows Gayatri <laughs> from all corners um, of the world. And she is in a, in the, on the advisory group of the Jeep. And it is so great to be back here in this part of the world and see so many wonderful colleagues out there. And I look forward to meeting those of you who I don't know. Um, NAA is also excited that we have an MOU with the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi that was signed in 2012. And we were part of the 2014 networking um, forum that was held in Abu Dhabi, which was a great opportunity. So really happy to be back. And I know that we have a lot of different cultures, languages, perspectives in this room, and we really look forward to hearing all your voices as we go through this session. And we also know that English is not everyone's first language, so let us know if we're going too fast and we can slow down, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Or if we use an acronym you don't understand, just raise your hand, okay? When I say EE, -E, I mean environmental education. So my brothers think EE -E is electrical engineering. <laughs> I've been in this field forever. <laughs> and they go, it's electrical engineering. It's environmental education. And we also do look forward to hearing, and we've been sharing all day today of what everybody is doing and so many great connections. There were so many good presentations. I see Abby there and Elena, they're really great presentations. And this is very informal, so please, if you have a question, we don't have to wait till the very end, raise your hand, that would be great. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a little introductory activity, then we're going to give an overview of NAAE so that, and environmental education, just so you know the context of how, we're, where we're coming from. Then we're going to talk about the Global Environmental Education Partnership, how you can get involved. Then Gayatri is going to do some closing remarks, and we're going to have some questions and answers. Sound okay to everybody? Yeah. And I think we lost 15 minutes, so I might go a little quicker. Um, so first, I just want to get to know who you are. So how many of you, raise your hand if you think you're an educator. Raise your hand. Okay. Ooh, a lot of hands. How about a scientist? Science? Okay. Good that you raised your hand. Um, she's a scientist. Um, a conservationist. How many would raise your hand? Okay, it's good to see people in the education, conservation, science. How about communicators? Okay, a lot of hands. Big data people. Okay, we've got big data. Anybody else? Just call out. What do you do that I didn't mention? Any policy folks? Yeah. Yeah, policy? Okay, we've got a good mix here. So what I want you to do now is find a partner. Okay, everybody have a partner, or you can have three, depending on where you are. And here's what you need to do. You and your partner need to be able to answer the question I'm about to ask you, and there is a fabulous prize up here. Um, you can get a bird or some chocolate, okay? But your partner and you both, you both have to be able to answer the question. When you've got it, raise your hand. It's really easy. You ready? Okay, and again, the winning pair will get a prize. You both get a prize. All you need to do is answer this question. How many squares? Raise your hand. Yeah, kids, you get it a lot faster than you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but they, one of them said 31 because square was at the top, the word. Oh, oh. That's very clever. Okay, so I started with this just saying that none of us is as smart as all of us. 
So some of you saw 16 right away, and then someone is like, well, I think there are like 17 or 21. So we can't solve our environmental issues unless, and social issues unless we're working together. And good leaders know how to get all the perspectives at the table and bring all the ideas when you have a team. And taking part in experiences is part of what education is about and allows us to dig a little deeper. And I love this quote by Mark Twain, who was, is a writer, was a writer in um, the United States. If you grab a cat by the tail, you will learn things that you can't learn in any other way. And that is what experiential learning is. You can't do it unless you learn it. And so when I hire people, I'm always looking for people that can lead teams and can be part of teams. So before we talk about the Jeep, what I'd like to do is give a little background on environmental education, just to give a perspective to those of you who didn't raise your hand as educators, and we're gonna go pretty quickly through this, and then we'll talk a little bit about NAAEE. So environmental education is a process, and it's trying to look at how to increase knowledge and awareness, skill building, increase motivation, leading to informed action. Our goal is to help people understand, care, learn, and actually do something. If you really care about an issue and you don't do anything, then we're no better off. So we are always convincing people to think about individually what can they do, collectively what they can do. And we talk about awareness to action, but it's not linear. So I can give somebody information and they can go right to action. There are a lot of underpinnings of the field and I'm gonna just go very quickly because I think a lot of you know this but it's based on systems thinking that we need to think about how everything is connected and we need to think about relationships and that's a lot of what this um, gathering is all about is how things are connected and what the context is. We're also based on, of course, the three pillars of sustainability. You can't talk about environmental integrity without talking about social equity, community well-being, the social people part, and shared prosperity for everyone. They are all connected. And we also in our field talk a lot about equity and social justice, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. It's also about lifelong learning. A lot of people, when they hear the word education, think kids in school or young people, and kids are so important, but so are all of you, and so are all adults. And so we talk about cradle to gray, so that, and we used to say cradle to grave, and it sounded kind of morbid, so we changed it to cradle to gray. But it's all sectors, it's schools, it's non-formal, it's nature centers, it's universities, it's business. We've done education programs with a number of major corporations, helping employees or helping business think about how to get employees to understand the issues. So when we talk about sustainable communities, we're talking about the formal school system and everything related to that and the non-formal, all the places you learn in society outside of school. And so in the United States, we have a little bit different in uh, education system. It is very decentralized. We don't have a national curriculum. It's school district by school district. And that's really good and it's really hard. So you can't just change something at the national level. It is um, district by district. So schools around the world are an incredible pipeline for learning. And that's why so many of us are trying to work in schools because everyone goes through this pipeline and we try to get as many people through the pipeline, through the universities, all of that. But we can't forget the informal part because we spend most of our lives outside of school unless you are a teacher or a professor, you're outside of school. So it's really important. Um, we also have a National Environmental Education Act in the United States and it's part of the Global Environmental Education Partnership, we are actually looking at policies around the world and how many countries have a national mandate for environmental education. And there are probably seven or eight that actually have it. And then they have, others have policies that are below the kind of the national level. What this did for us is that we have an Office of Environmental Education in our Environmental Protection Agency, and that helps support environmental education across the country. It's political. Every year we have to lobby to get this money and to help get this support, but it's so important. We're also based on science. We can't do what we do without a core grounding in science. Everything we do is based in science. We also talk about the importance of place 
and how important that is to understand where you come from, where your waste goes, where your water goes, what kind of biodiversity you have in your community. And we help people make informed decisions. That's part of it. And a lot of people don't learn how to set priorities and how to make informed decisions. And that is critical in our country. We have a very big election coming up. And a lot of people either don't read up, don't think about it, just go to the polls, don't. We want people to help them think about how they can make an informed decision. And so when people ask me, what's the difference between education and communication and why is education so important? And part of it is this learning process that everybody in this room has gone through. And it's the experiential learning process where you experience something and you process it. You generalize, like as you learn something of what does this mean to the bigger world? And the most important thing is you apply it. And we go through this cycle all the time. And it allows you to go deeper and to actually change your worldview. This is where I have seen magic happen with education, where people have actually changed their life course. They've thought about things differently. It's so critical. And the Sustainable Schools Initiative that the team from Abu Dhabi is leading, and I see Rasha there and Mona and all of you, is is a fantastic example of learning by doing, where the young people are actually doing real projects. So we often talk about teaching people how to think, not what to think. The goal of education is critical thinking skills and to lead from building awareness and knowledge to actually action and civic engagement, to actually doing something to improve the environment, to help your community. Um, so in the last decade, to probably two decades, we have moved from building awareness and knowledge, that's still critical, but moving to the action is really important. We are trying to create global citizens through education. That's what we're trying to do. And then we actually did a project in the US with a lot of partners to look, what does it mean to be environmentally literate? What does that look like? And so we came up with a definition that a lot of people weighed in on. And it's a core part of it is actually being active in civic life. These are the components of environmental literacy. We know there's knowledge, there's skills, you need to have the skills. The dispositions are really important, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then environmentally responsible behaviors at an individual level, also at a community level, at an organizational level. So when I talk about dispositions, we're finding out how important this is. Facts only go so far. And if people, people, sometimes in the environmental movement, and I've been guilty of this, we just give people more information and it doesn't sway them because the caring part, the personal responsibility, the whether what I do makes a difference always into whether you actually are going to do something. So the caring part is truly important. And we are trying to get people to be active, thoughtful citizens. So we have experienced, as everybody knows, and we have the technology to show the massive environmental loss that is taking place around the world. And some of it is, of course, at a planetary level that is a change from the past. We have these issues like climate change, loss of biodiversity, water quality that are really impacting globally. And we have linked to that massive social issues. So we're always looking at what is education's response? to these issues. And we're about creating a healthy environment, but also healthy communities and that overlay. And again, this focus on sustainability and the focus on the sustainable development goals. What's the role of education? Not only number four, but what's the role of education in achieving all of the sustainability goals? So the Global Environmental Education Partnership is a learning network that was developed kind of organically, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we are talking about how can we co-create a global network to advance all the great work that's going on around the world in environmental education, and especially how can we learn from each other and share best practice? What's the best way to do that? And it started as a partnership between the Environmental Protection Agency in Taiwan, NAAE, and the Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S., and NAAE is the Secretariat of the Jeep. And I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Melissa who is amazing and is going to talk about NAAE. Thank you so much, Judy. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. 
So um, NAAEE, uh, we are the professional association. We call ourselves the professional association, the backbone organization for environmental education professionals in North America. So the US, Canada, and Mexico. But we also do, we have quite a lot of partnerships in other countries, and we'll talk about those. And our mission is really all about advancing environmental literacy and civic engagement. Ultimately, using education to create a more sustainable future. So it's all about education leading to action. We see environmental education as a critical tool in our toolbox to address very complicated social and environmental issues that we're facing today. And so if you were to take a 30,000 foot view of what we would love to see, we want a future where all education is environmental education, meaning Education is just, environmental education is just part of everything we learn. All jobs are green jobs, all consumers are green consumers, all homes are green homes, and all businesses are green businesses. Wouldn't that be amazing? Isn't that what we all want? <laughs> and we, we understand that healthy and economically productive societies, like Judy was saying, the pillars of sustainability require healthy environments. Quality of life is intrinsically tied to quality of the environment and vice versa. We serve a very broad audience. Judy mentioned both formal educators and those working in the non-formal sector out of school, which is where we spend a lot of our time, young people, people, retirees, everyone in between, it's all of that. And our ultimate goal, we wanna create change. We're not just, this isn't just education as a process, but it's a process that leads to action and change. We have 30 countries that work with us global, globally. We'll talk about that a little bit more through the Global Environmental Education Partnership and some other partnerships. And we kind of consider ourselves a network of networks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the networks that we've developed over the years. And one of our most thriving networks are our local, regional, state and regional and provincial affiliates. Uh, these are separate NGOs working on the ground in the US and Canada um, and regionally. And we partner with them on a variety of issues and they are really one of our biggest assets. They are kind of our on the ground force for environmental education. And here is just a snapshot of some of our affiliates. And we know that we are all stronger when we work together. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that's really important to us. And we can better address all the complicated issues we're facing. One of our signature programs is a partnership that we have with the US Environmental Protection Agency. And this is a five year uh, grant that we received with them. And we're in year two now. And it's a very, it's, it's kind of their largest grant that they give out as part of the National Environmental Education Act and the Office of Environmental Education. And the whole, the point of this is it's called From Inspiration to Impact. You need the heart, but we also want to have impact. We need the passion and the impact. And it's all about professional development, teacher trainings, educator trainings, really advancing the field, growing capacity. And we work with several partners on this grant. Again, and this is a really signature partnership program. You can find it, there's a lot more to say about this program, but you can find out more on our website, naae.org. We also work with several federal, US federal government partners on this grant. And another way that we kind of serve as a network of networks is through a program called the Natural Start Alliance. And this is all about early childhood environmental education. We focus on um, early childhood ed, uh, environmental educators and nature preschools. We have more than 430 preschool members, nature-based preschools. Um, and every year we host a conference and a convening of them. Uh, and, and then another big way that we kind of connect and network people is through our annual conference. And this year, we just hosted one <laughs> about a week ago in Spokane, Washington in the US, and we had 1,300 people from about 30 countries. It's a great opportunity for networking and learning. Next year, we'll be in Lexington, Kentucky in the US around the same time, October 14th, that week. Yeah, okay, save the date if you're interested. As part of this conference, we host a research symposium. So looking at the most current research in environmental education 
and also linking research to practice, which is so important in our field. That's a big focus of this symposium as well, and that kind of leads the conference. One of the ways we build capacity is through uh, the National Project for Excellence in Environmental Education. We call them the Guidelines for Excellence. And we have run this program with several partners uh, in collaboration for years. And it's really, these are guidelines for, for effective practice in environmental education on everything from early childhood education to K through 12 to formal education to working in communities. That's our newest one. And that we actually have a copy of that. You can, you can look at this also online. You can download all of them for free. Threatened or endangered species in the area. There, you got it. We gave you a hint. OK. This is an easy one, OK? Is a whale shark a mammal or a fish? It's a fish. It's the actually the largest fish in the world. Very good. Right up there, right up there. OK. And I think. One more. What's the most common bird on the planet? Good guess. Anybody? Whoops. Chickens. OK, so everybody close your eyes, because we're going to go through the rest. Don't look. Don't look. Don't, 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 don't. OK. So we'll have something else later. Um, so now, what I'd like to do is actually introduce the Global Environmental Education Partnership. And the mission of the Global Environmental Education Partnership is actually to create this vibrant learning network. We are trying to connect people. We are all dealing with so many of the same issues, all of us. We're all trying to raise money. We're all trying to have impact. We're all trying to base what we do on research and what we learned. So this network is trying to share best practice, connect people, support policies that will sustain environmental education, and show that education can be a critical tool to achieving our environmental social conservation goals. So it's all about building capacity for environmental education. That's what we're trying to do. And we did our homework. We were looking for where are the gaps? What do we need to do in our global society for environmental education. So we talked to a lot of people, we've talked to a lot of organizations, and this is an informal network. It's not a formal government network. It's government, it's non-formal, it's university, and we're all sharing. And our goal is actually to create strong partnerships and also a learning network. That's what we're trying to do. So the goals of the project are really to connect and build bridges. So this is the really the core of trying to connect people, researchers, policymakers, all of that, and work on demonstrating the value and impact of education and helping to achieve the sustainable development goals. We also want to help support and mentor and empower a new generation and make sure that they have the tools and the training and the leadership skills to help shape the future. And we want to build a global fund. We haven't started this yet, but the major issue, no matter who you talk to, is funding. It's not a dearth of ideas. It's not a dearth of um, people willing and passionate. It's money. And so we want to try and see if we can raise some additional money. And we want to promote innovation. That's what we're trying to do. So when we started the Jeep, we actually did a survey around the world and asked, what are the issues you care about most? And it's so funny that we all have similar issues, everything from more professional development to promoting research and evaluation. There was a lot of interest in evaluation because a lot of people are being asked to evaluate programs and show impact, but they don't have training in evaluation and research. And we have actually have a lot of tools at NAAEE to help that, and we're actually building a global evaluation portal complement our global research portal to help people link research and practice and also think about evaluation. So we've had a number of, I think the Jeep is now going on its fourth year. It started out of just trying to think it through. Gayatri is part of our advisory, amazing advisory group. And it actually is allowing us to talk as a field, figure out what we want to do, link to all the good stuff. Like one of our advisory board members is from UNAP. We've got such great insight from around the world. 
and we just had a meeting um, in Spokane. So do you know how that photo was taken? With a drone, right, which was a lot of fun to do that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Melissa to talk about the global call for action and uh, something that we hope you'll get involved in. Thanks, Judy. So we had a really, uh, so the Jeep, one of the functions that we serve is to be kind of a global champion for environmental education. And last year we had the opportunity to think about um, what we wanted to achieve, reflecting back on a commemorative activity, which was the 40th anniversary of the Tbilisi Declaration. Does anyone, does, do people know what that is? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Tbilisi Declaration. Okay, so I'll just give you a, a, a little background on it. Um, it really is, it was, it was established in 1977 um, with UNESCO and 65 member states. And it was, it's really largely known as the founding of modern day environmental education. It talks a lot about those principles. Judy talked about awareness to action and knowledge and skills building. Um, and it also talks a lot about sustainability and the role of environmental education in solving complex environmental issues. It's actually quite an interesting document to read. Um, but we were celebrating in 2017 the 40th anniversary, and we had an opportunity to kind of take stock of where we've come over the last 40 years. And so, and kind of look honestly at what we've achieved and celebrate a little bit. Well, we growing leadership. Um, so these are all available online to read. I just wanted you to see kind of what we did. And so we asked people, we released the survey in October of 2017, kept it open for about six months, and we received hundreds of responses from about 46 countries around the world. And so after we closed the survey around Earth Day, um, we, an we analyzed the responses. And what's interesting is, does anyone want to guess what action, let's just go back quickly to the action, what action might be the top for people? Any, any, any guess? There's no wrong answer. One. We have, what were you going to say? One. Action one, champion environmental education. OK. Yeah. yeah. Any other? Number four. four. Number four? Yeah. Number, Number six? six. <laughs> Anything else? Five. Five? OK. Six. Well, you're all right. <laughs> So the findings really showed, and this is you, you're kind of reflecting the diversity of responses that we received, that really participants demonstrated support for all of the 10 actions. And what we really found was a lot of the actions complemented each other, and that we really started a conversation. People share a lot of input and really rich perspectives on the action and the next steps that they felt we should take. So this is just kind of a map of responses. And so now we're at the point where we're feeding back to the community. And if you go to actnowforee.org, you can see some of this feedback um, on the website. So the 10 actions and then kind of some of the quotes. So if you look at create and empower global citizens, here's just some, some feedback. Some of the, the, so develop an education system and platform to equip students with competencies to contribute to sustainable development. And you can see that also overlaps with the sustainable development action. Really focus more on action-oriented work and create a global community to focus on solutions. And this is just, there's more there to read. When we look at EE's role in achieving the SDGs, another sampling, just really, really continue to align EE with all of the SDGs. It, there's a lot of discussion about global collaborations and sharing platforms and tech, using technology. And again, the global fund comes up. <laughs> we all need money. So this is just, just uh, one step in that process. And now Judy's going to kind of take us through what we have developed based on all that input as a next step. But what we did is we took those 10 actions and then we, we asked people these actions would lead to what goals? And so we, this is what we came up with again with international participation. And all of you know, when you ask kind of the world for input, it's a lot of input. <laughs> and so 
these goals of what we're trying to do, that every nation has an environmentally informed, empowered, and active population, that the leadership of every institution, whether it's government, business, NGO, is actually using environmental education or education for sustainability or whatever you want to call it to achieve these outcomes. And every education institute embeds environmental education and literacy into what they're trying to do. And so we developed a pledge. Um, and I will show you the pledge video to see if it works. If not, the, you can go online to Act Now for EE and see the video of people that were involved just reading the pledge. And we already have over 260 individuals and organizations that have signed, and we launched it like four days ago, or last week. <laughs> so we're, what we're trying to do is show how many people care about this. So here we go. Let's see if this works. Studies. 
For example, there's one on Keep Northern, from Keep Northern Ireland, beautiful. Every single school in Northern Ireland is an eco school. We wanted to know what did they learn from that? What happened? What could other places replicate? So we do need more um, case studies and country profiles, and we'd love to talk to any of you that are interested in helping us. We would love that. We also have a program called 30 Under 30. Um, this is where we are every year on the lookout for 30 incredible young people from around the world that are doing amazing things and using education to help further their goals. We actually just brought 15 of the 30, we had scholarship money, to the conference last week, and they thought it was like the most amazing professional development opportunity. These are incredible young people. So we'll be launching the new one um, in 2019, and it's, we've also heard people tell us we need to do 70 under 70 <laughs> and 60 under 60, but these young people are really incredible. And thanks to the sponsors, we're able to help support their work, and they can use it on their resumes. And it's building leadership skills. We we bring four of them to the com uh, four of them that we brought to the conference were on a plenary panel. They've never been on a plenary panel, and a chance to talk to you know 600 people is a great professional development learning opportunity. And then we also at the Jeep really like thinking kind of outside the box. So if you have innovative ideas in education, we'd love to hear from them. So you can get involved in a lot of different ways. Just come talk to us, sign the pledge, join the Global EE Pro Group, and you can contact us directly at info at the Jeep.org. And you can go to the Jeep.org website to find the country profiles and the case studies. And finally, I um, just wanted to talk about a little bit about the work between linking education and conservation. How can we build a stronger conservation constituency? And I've worked most of my life in conservation organizations at World Wildlife Fund, at the National Wildlife Federation in the US, at the National Audubon Society. And a lot of the questions are really, how can we build this constituency and how can we use education to help achieve our conservation goals? And this is a really important thing to think about if you're planning conservation programs, how are people involved in that process? And we think that integrated conservation, where we're all working together, is a lot stronger than if you have communication over here, science over here, policy over here. You're actually all at the same table trying to address the same issue. You're just doing different pieces of the puzzle to achieve a goal. So conservation is actually all about people, and we were trying to help develop some tools to build people into the conservation planning process. And we talk about the social strategies and how the social strategies, environmental education, communication, social marketing, can actually help us achieve our conservation goals. So we have a tool, and I think we have copies of it somewhere um, here, that is called the toolkit, the tools of engagement, that is building on the, uh, uh, the standards, uh, the, um, open, uh, the open standards, wait, I'm okay. Open standards. The open standards for practice and conservation. Sorry, I'm there. I'm a little jet lagged and they all started sounding the same. Open practice. But anyway, it's a process that a lot of the conservation groups got together and said, what does best practice look like in conservation planning? We thought it left a little bit out on the people's side on how do you develop messages? How do you target your audiences? How do you decide whether environmental education is important, social marketing, a combo, communication, and that's what we were trying to do. So we'll have these up um, here that if you are interested in that tool, you can get it. It's also online and you can download it. And I helped develop that when I was at Audubon and we have permission to use it in all of our workshops. And then I just want to do a few last words in environmental education and then we'll leave time for questions. I think that the need has never been greater for environmental education. We all know the issues that we're facing. We've all talked about them today in different ways and both at the data forum and here. Disappearing biodiversity, the severe weather that we're facing, um, droughts, um, we've all had it and you know, it doesn't matter where you live in the globe, there have been issues linked to climate change, water shortages, issues with water quality, overfishing, ocean acidification. I could go on and on. Lots of communities in trouble, <clears throat> excuse me, 
And a lot of people, like in the United States, one in three people are poor. Um, we know that people around the world are trying to survive on almost nothing. So we've got a lot of issues. And this can get really discouraging. <laughs> no, that's for you guys. Um, but I think that education and educators help bring the hope because we are actually helping people navigate through the issues, develop the tools, the empowerment, the leadership to actually tackle these. The world's going to be very different. But it's an opportunity to tackle those new challenges in new and different ways with science, with technology, and with so many other um, things. So environmental education is a critical tool in our toolbox. And I think it's really important that we, we bring it to the table early on as we're trying to address these issues. And I do believe in the power of education. I have really seen it change lives in so many different ways. Fellowship programs, just so many ways. And I also believe in the power of collaboration. We cannot do this work alone, and we've got to start a little bit with the, without the competition. Yeah, you have a question? I have a question. Do we have a mic so that other people can hear? And do you want to say your name and where you're from? Um, not sure, because you might not like my question. Yeah. <laughs> I like all questions. There's no bad questions. And if it's really hard, I'll make it Melissa or a guy answer it. Okay. No. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Can we turn this on? Yeah. It's working. It was working. It was working. working. Okay, go for it. Hello? Okay. Yeah, my name is Peter Barrington with the Environment Department of the Municipality. So I've been in this business for a long time, and I usually our role is to provide advice on environmental aspects related to just about anything. I think that when you made the comment about cradle to grave, that wasn't what I was thinking. I was thinking more cradle to cradle because we need to empower our present leaders now to be able to make decisions that are better informed when it comes to the environment. We can't wait for the next generation, and I don't think it's fair on them for us to say, okay, we're going to try and find some leaders, some young leaders, because we couldn't do it right. And I don't think that's, I think this is important to do, but I also think it's really important that we, in this room, we should have people from the private sector in here. We should have people from the energy sector. We should have the people that are forced to make the decisions that don't have the information they need to make ones that are, yeah. uh, that are more sensible. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I yeah. guess it's more of a comment, but I yeah. think if we could empower our present leaders as yeah. far as environment goes, yeah. I think this is where we need to target. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your name, your first name? Oh, um, Mohammed. Uh, Peter. Peter. No, Peter. Yes. Peter. <laughs> okay. So Peter, I totally agree. That's what I was saying about informal education. It is not just kids in school. Kids are important. We can't not educate the next generation. It is educating adults. It's educating businesses. It's educating leaders. Yeah, so I, I'm agreeing with you, I think. We need to target our leaders. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't mean, I mean, it's not, they're not just one of a series. No, 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 no. They I should agree. be our priority. Yeah. To I, I think they're one of our priorities. I totally agree with you. And uh, it's really important that, and, and one of the things actually in the toolkit, when we're talking about who your audience is, some people talk about the general public. If you talk to a communication expert, they will say, okay, when you wake up in the morning, do you ever say, hey, I'm a member of the general public? It is not an audience. Then the more you target your audience, the more effective you're going to be. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still talk with, uh, you know, young people. They're both important. But I agree. Okay. Thank you, Judy. And um, it's it, it really feels funny here. I've been with Eye on the Earth from its inception, been with uh, Jeep since its inception, and been with EAD and the Sustainable School Design since inception again. And so it feels a little strange hearing all of that come. Anyway, I've been in the field of environmental education for the past 40 years. And from what I say is, I was trying to say it in the last webinar when my throat sort of gave up on me, which is what Peter Senge had said in the fifth discipline book, where he said, we do, the world doesn't need a few smart people. It needs collective wisdom of many. And that is what, again and again, we're all saying we need to collaborate together. And especially the IPCC report that had just come, you know, just 10 days back, if you look at that report, 
I think this sentence makes sense more than ever. We need to really, I know I've been in the field of environment education long enough to know that even in the field of environment education, we have a lot of ego action still. Mm -hmm. We need to get out of that and we need to have an ego action. We need to get together, all of us, regardless of whichever organization, NGO, government, and private, and whatever that we are, very fast and very quick if we are to weather what IPCC is predicting for us. That's one thing that I'd like to say. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone, but before that, I have an announcement to make. You see, we've got these two kits that we've brought for you, but whoever signs the pledge gets it. So call for action. <laughs> you can sign the pledge in your mobile phone right away if you want. But don't worry, I'm just joking. I take it, you have to promise me that you will sign the pledge when you go back. And then we would give you a, a toolkit for you. And the other toolkits that um, uh, Judy was talking about, the NWAW guidelines, I think Again, we've been very, very fortunate with the Sustainable Schools Initiative. We had uh, the NWW come here and do a training for our teachers. Unfortunately, it was Pepe's no longer, and we, we had our uh, you know, person from EPA, I mean, from the NWW who had come and done that uh, uh, amazing man, amazing man. He had introduced the NWW guidelines on environment education to all our teachers. So I know that all our teachers have a soft version of this uh, thing. And uh, that's about it. Thank you all. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Russia. Thank you, everyone. There's one question from Jordan. Okay. Okay. For, for Judy. Judy. Yes. Okay. Can okay. I have a question? No, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We can do this together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is uh, Sarah from Jordan. She's asking, uh, how can we uh, share knowledge and success stories in the Middle East? And the second question is, how can uh, we get fun to work more on building uh, in our best practices that we uh, think? So in terms of sharing best practice, I think probably everybody in this room and everybody listening is trying to share best practice. We're trying with the case studies, with the guidelines, with the things that we're producing and sending it out, having webinars, trying to help other people um, share those stories. And if there are great stories from the Middle East, we would love to share them through our networks and other people will share them as well. And we'd love to talk with whomever is asking the question from Jordan, that uh, we'd love to talk with, with him or her to, or they to talk about the, um, any stories that are coming from this region. We think that would be great. Exactly, and I will just add that please just email Judy or myself and we'll set up a time to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and anyone in this room, please use our direct emails if you have ideas for case studies or country profiles. Um, we would love to talk with you. And the, and the, the other question, oh, you no, okay. I think Jordan has amazing examples. And from what I know, or what I have networked with Jordan, I think you have wonderful case studies that you can share with all of us, so please do that. And I think the last question was how to fund, was that right? Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Yes, so should we pass around a hat here so that people can <laughs> contribute money for the caller? Um, we could take that offline because there are so many issues around trying to raise money but we actually try to bring in money to give it back out so that people can do good stuff. And just like everybody else, we're all struggling with where to get funding. Every country has a different culture for philanthropy, and corporations will give money, government will give money, individuals will give money, people give money in their wills in the United States. Um, there are just a number of ways to get it, and it's trying to figure out how to get it. So we'd be happy to talk to that person as well. Um, later about different fundraising options. And um, there's another question that I just asked how, how can we get the toolkit? Um, we will send out the link to the toolkit. It's online and all the guidelines for excellence are online as well. And there are a lot of other resources. In our session tonight, we'll go into a little bit more depth on EE Pro and some of the resources, but we can send that that can then go back out to the web, to everybody that's on the webcast. This is the question from Mexico. Oh, from Mexico, and we have a, we did have a, 
started an affiliate in Mexico. So, um, and we also have a chief advisor in Mexico City, and I can send that name to that person as well. Thank you. Any other questions? In the room, anybody? A lot of experts in the room. Hi, I'm Heidi Pearson. I'm working at Grid Arendelle in Norway this fall um, on a Fulbright Fellowship, but back home I'm a professor at the University of Alaska Southeast. And so you brought up the uh, concept of accreditation for universities, and I was wondering more about the process of how we might go about doing that at my school. Mm -hmm. You might be able to say a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah, so the, accredit the accreditation process, what we were looking at at first in the U.S., is how to accredit universities. Look, let me explain that there are two things. One is accrediting universities that have solid environmental education programs. The guidelines, and we can send this to you so you can take a look at it and adapt it to whatever fits your country, um, was looking at if you meet these guidelines that are based on the guidelines for excellence in terms of at the university level what they're doing, then we would accredit you. And it's not me individually. There is a panel that accredits. And so we have about eight universities that are accredited to date, and we are pushing that out as well. We also, when Melissa was talking about certification, we certify individuals through our affiliates that get certified in environmental education, and those are also based on the best practice. So people have to go through, and it's a competency-based certification, not just you do this and then you do this, and it's actually what can you show that you did. So I'll be happy to share with anyone that wants the accreditation guidelines or any of the other materials. 